I, would you like to introduce our guest? Well, thank you so very much, uh, Michael, for accepting this invitation. I remember how we were talking about this so many times, you know, so finally it's happening. I'm, um, it's my immense pleasure to introduce, I hear I'm introducing, I'm especially addressing the students in modernism because this is how I came up with this idea. Yes, when we were having, um, we're having a course in modernism and I was thinking, wow, I happen to know this authority, yes, in modernism. So how about if I approach this person? And I was so fortunate because you said yes, for which I'm very, very grateful. Uh, Professor North is, according to me and I think other uh, critics and scholars in the field as well, one of the leading literary scholars in the United States. Professor North is professor of English at the University of California, Los Angeles, and author of numerous scholarly books and articles that have challenged our understanding of modernism. My first encounter with Professor North's work, for example, was when I was a graduate student of the English department in, uh, and he's the dialectic of modernism, race, language, and 20th century literature made me aware how American literary expression has been intertwined with race. Um, his other books exhibit the same depth and vision, as well as a desire to undermine preconceived notions about modernism and modernity. These are Reading 1922, A Return to the Scene of the Modern, um, then we have camera works, photography, and the 20th century word. Machine age comedy, um, then novelty, a history of the new, and Professor North's recent, What is the Present, um, that was published by Princeton University Press in 2018. Professor North's Essays published in such prestigious periodicals as Critical Inquiry, American Literary History, American Literature, PM PMLA, and Contemporary Literature have always generated a lot of interest in the scholarly community in the US and abroad. Uh, he's also a recipient of various awards, such as a Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship, a US President's Research Fellowship, the Modern Studies Association Book Prize, or the Robert Motherwell Book Award for his novelty, A History of the New. Yes, that was for this one, yes. Um, in 2012, Professor North was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. The idea of inviting Professor North to speak at Wasser University germinated over 10 years ago when I had an opportunity to meet him personally uh, on, UC, uh, on the UCLA campus and uh, felt both intimidated by the breadth of scholarship and impressed uh, with the openness and friendliness. Um, Professor North, Michael, we have been delaying this talk far too long. Even though it was meant to be in person, still I'm thrilled that it is finally happening and that you are with us. Without further ado, I'm leaving the floor to Professor, Northen, no, uh, Professor North. The topic of his talk today is modernism and style. And I'm so sorry for the Freudian slip, you know, because <laughs> for Norton, you know, yeah, that, yes, that's in well, a sense, because this is how I think about you, you know, like this really, um, you know, um, important, towering um, figure for the field of American studies? Well, I'll, I'll try not to tower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is one of the funny things about the whole uh, Zoom era, you know, which is, it makes it possible to uh, give talks uh, that have long been planned, but held up by the practical difficulties of doing something like flying from Los Angeles to Warsaw, which uh, we've never been able to, to work out. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for your wonderful introduction, and uh, I'm glad to, uh, I, I was going to say glad to be here, but uh, to be doing this, whatever, the, whatever this is. 
Um, maybe let me start here by um, giving some general explanations and uh, some disclaimers. Um, it, it happened to me with this topic, uh, the way it's happened uh, with a lot of topics recently, uh, thinking about modernism, style of modernism, modernist style, uh, it occurred to me that I couldn't really think about those things without knowing first what style is. Uh, the same thing happened to me when I was thinking about Pound's little slogan, make it new. It occurred to me that I really you know, couldn't understand what that meant without knowing what novelty is. Well, the problem uh, with both of those terms, I guess, is that though they're really very simple terms, uh, they're also ineffably vague and strange. And so it's very difficult to say what style is. Uh, in fact, it turns out, I think it's a little bit easier to say what modernist style is than it is to say what style is, which seems logically upside down. Uh, you shouldn't be able to define an instance of something without knowing what the general term means. But, but I think that's true. And uh, that paradoxical situation then is sort of the, the topic of this talk. Uh, what I wanna think about is the odd sort of paradoxical relationship between style in general and style in particular, and really to uh, apply that paradox to the situation of modernism um, and modernity. So I actually, and these, I guess is, this is the disclaimer part, won't really be talking about modernist style in any particular way. I uh, won't be talking about modernist styles and I won't actually be talking about any modernist works, which I hope won't be a terribly, terrible disappointment, but I will be working in a very general and abstract and kind of trans-historical way. Well, I guess the other part of the disclaimer is that this really was never uh, planned as a talk, was never never done as a talk, it's, just, it's a chapter. So it's very long and it's kind of dense and it's got a lot of citations and references in it. Um, I, I, I don't intend to read it out to you because that would be, I think, very boring uh, under any circumstances, but particularly in a Zoom situation, I think being read to is, is very, very boring. Um, so what I will do is, is kind of ad lib my way through the text and more or less turn it into a talk on the fly. Uh, I've pulled out uh, some salient quotations and made a little PowerPoint presentation out of those. So every now and then, uh, I mean, at, at a fairly early stage here, I will switch uh, and share my screen and turn PowerPoint on and you'll be able to see quotations as I, as I go through. Um, but basically I'll just be kind of ad-libbing my way through uh, a, a written text. And um, that may, may work and it may not work actually. I don't really actually know since I'm not, I'm not done it this way. Uh, I think uh, it might take about 40 or 45 minutes or so, including this part. Um, and I think that's just about right. If it's, too sh if it's short, that's probably great. Uh, if it starts to go too long, uh, you, somebody just make me stop. Okay. So anyway, to, to, to get into the, the, the talk itself, I guess, the first thing to say um, is to admit that the topic of modernism and style is not exactly a really hot topic right now. Um, there's not a lot of attention to stylistic issues. Uh, there's not uh, a lot of debate about what modernist style is. There are not a lot of attempts to define it. Uh, uh, the example I have in my text here is the recent uh, Cambridge History of Modernism, which came out uh, a few years ago. It's 960 pages long, and there's no entry for style in the index. Uh, it's a similar situation, I think, in, in art history. Uh, there's a pretty prominent, widely used, uh, anth not anthology, but sort of uh, what guidebook to art history called Critical Terms for Art History. I think Hopkins puts it out. Uh, the first edition of that came out back in the 90s, and they had no chapter in it on style at all. Uh, so then when the, when the second edition came out, they did uh, supply a chapter on style, but it was very short and kind of shamefaced and was really basically about why they hadn't had a chapter in the first edition. So I, these, just, just a couple of examples here, I think, to, to uh, support the general notion that style is not a category that's, that's pursued a lot right now, even in art history, where, where of course for decades, and I guess you could even say centuries, criticism of style was really the focus of most scholarship. The reasons for that, I, I think, are pretty easy to figure out. Uh, I mean, most of us are doing some kind of cultural studies work at the moment. Uh, our interests are 
are historical or political, uh, those tend then to focus, I think, more on the subject matter of the works than, than on the style, although there obviously are ways of integrating, you know, investigations of style into that. It just has happened in practice that the attention has been displaced away from aesthetic matters and, and more onto issues, context, you know, the kinds of things that, that cultural studies you know, tend, tends to talk about. Uh, but I think in terms of modernism, there's an, there's an additional reason why uh, the desire uh, to define modernist style has declined recently. Uh, and that is that it, in practice, it has proved very, very difficult to come up with a workable uh, definition or even some useful generalizations about what modernist style might include. And here, just as an illustrative quotation here, I'm gonna then go to my share screen and see if I can go to where my PowerPoint is here. And share that. Um, and the quotation that I've got here is, is uh, from uh, Jameson's Singular Modernity. Um, and what it's illustrating here is the fact that any empirical attempt to define modernist style, it's almost inevitably doomed to fail. So as Jameson puts it, any theory of modernism capacious enough to include uh, a Joyce along with Yeats or Proust, uh, let alone alongside Vallejo, Bailey, Gide, or Bruno Schulz, is bound to be so vague and vacuous as to be intellectually inconsequential. And you can see, if you look at that quote, that actually Jameson has uh, made his task a little bit easier by limiting himself to literature. I uh, just can imagine how much more difficult it would be if he'd thrown in some architects, some musicians, a painter or sculptor or two. You know, then the, the multiplicity of modernist styles becomes so dizzying that, uh, you know, as, as, as Jameson says, any theory of modernism that tries to do this is, is just basically going to fail. Um, what is going on here, I suppose, is maybe a little bit more general than modernism. I mean, it's a failure of the, the empirical attempt to define something. Uh, and I think we are all familiar with the way this works in studies of modernism. You, you pick out four or five you know, important figures that you think of as being typically modernist. You figure out what the common features are in their style. Then you generalize from those and come up with some, some sort of central common uh, stylistic uh, uh, practices that seem to obtain across all of these cases. And lo and behold, you come up with a definition of modernist style that perfectly illustrates the four or five people that you picked out in the first place, uh, which only shows just how circular the whole empirical process is. Uh, I think this is especially the case with something that says as uh, what various and, and different from itself as modernism is. So, uh, you know, there are various different ways around this. Uh, and I think we're probably all familiar with what these are. You can have multiple modernisms. Uh, you can define modernism in terms of paradox and, and bring in quite different definitions in that way. Uh, you can uh, do typologies. You can do say five types of modernity or five types of modernism. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, that, that really just multiplies the problem. I mean, if you have five kinds of modernism and you still are pursuing an empirical definition, you have the same problems that Jameson is talking about just five times over. It doesn't really help to multiply modernism in that respect. It's more common now than to give up on the attempt to what, epitomize modernist style or define it. And actually, I'd go a little bit farther than that, that it's now sometimes common, given the fact that people have been incapable of uh, coming up with acceptable general definitions for modernist style, it's now sometimes, well, at least it happens, that people will give up on the notion of modernism altogether. So uh, my example here is from Sean Latham and Gail Rogers, who in, in their recent book, Modernism, Evolution of an Idea, they just say flatly, there is no such thing as modernism. And the thing that they mean by that uh, is that they can't come up with a stylistic generalization that will fit all the examples they're interested in. So the examples they give are the literature of 1920s Paris, the ceramics of Tang Dynasty China, and the music of contemporary Afghanistan. So you see, we've expanded the field an awful lot from the kind of thing that Jameson is doing. This makes it much more difficult to define modernism than before. And so, you know, Rogers and Latham then just decide, well, there is no such thing as modernism. 
Now, I think, I guess, for fairly obvious reasons, I think that's kind of a shame. Uh, it's, it's a term that we all use that, that is, is used in programs like this one. Uh, it's used all over the world. Uh, it's, it's a little uh, sad to give up on it altogether. And I also, to, to speak more specifically, uh, I think it's sad or, or maybe inadvisable to give up on the notion of style in relationship to modernism. Um, and that's not because I think I can do it. And I'm, and I'm not going to say that I can come up with a definition where other people have not been able to. Um, what I want to say today is that a certain kind of concern with style is, is intrinsic, uh, not just to modernism, uh, but to modernity. And I want to define that, in, in, as you'll see in a second, in, in a very, very large way. So uh, it's not that, that I'm going to come forward with a, what, a, a more successful attempt to do what Jameson says can't be done. But what I want to talk about is a kind of very, very close relationship between the whole concept of the modern and style as such. Um, one of the ways I want to pursue that, I guess the first way I want to pursue that, is by taking a kind of excursion uh, into a certain kind of etymology or into the etymology of the term. So I think everybody is aware that uh, behind the English word modern and its variants in other languages, there's the Latin noun modus, and that the Latin noun means or meant measured amount, limit, manner, kind, or tone. And this, of course, then you know goes through uh, French and, and comes into English as, as mode. Um, and becomes part of certain phrases like a la mode and thus gets associated uh, with, with fashion. At the same time, or actually in, at earlier, um, the, the root modus had actually acquired uh, or produced a temporal adjective, modernus, uh, by the addition of the R on, on a fairly common model in Latin, uh, words like nocturnus and, and hodiernus. On that model, then the word modernus was coined from mode. And uh, the uh, temporal adjective then means just now or at the present time. So we've got then two different um, words that have come from the, the root. We have mode and we have modern, sort of two offspring of this root word. And the interesting relation that I want to, to look at between them, which may already be obvious just from my listing the two words, comes about actually uh, from Renaissance, uh, Italian, Italian Renaissance art theory. Uh, that modus is one of the many Italian synonyms uh, used uh, in, in the Renaissance for maniera or, or style. There are a number of different Italian words that can be used for style. Stile would be the mo more obvious one. But, but in the Renaissance, maniera was the preferred term for style. And, and mode or modo uh, in Italian was the term that was used uh, as a kind of parallel to it. So if you can see this quotation here from Poussin, which of course not an Italian, but he's working off of this kind of uh, Renaissance art theory. Poussin says, this word mode means properly the ratio of the, or the measure and form that we employ to do anything, a certain manner or determined and fixed order in the process by which a thing preserves its being. Okay, so that's then one, side, one, one offspring from our, our word modo, our, uh, the Latin modus. This is the mode, which means the ratio or measure or form. It's a, it's a way of doing something, which corresponds fairly closely to what we think of as uh, style right now. Moderno, the other, the other offspring from this root word, uh, appears fairly early on in, in Cianino Cianini's Il Libro dell'Arte, which is actually a kind of a, not really a theory book, but a kind of a handbook for artists, came out in the early 15th century. And, and Giotto gives us, a, excuse me, Cianini gives us, <clears throat> in talking about Giotto, gives us a really interesting uh, example of how Moderno is used at this time. Giotto removed the art of painting from Greek into Latin and reduced it to the modern. Reduce al moderno is, is the Italian here. Now, of course, what he means here is that and there's a passage here then from you know, the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. Uh, the Middle Ages are the, the Greek because the, a lot of the art forms of the time were related to Byzantine practices. So they're, they're Greek. The Latin then would be the, the Italian um, modernity of the time. Uh, and what he's basically claiming here is that Giotto is the first person here to become really self-conscious about art, 
to get out of the what sort of rigid habits and traditions or what the Renaissance believed were the rigid habits and traditions of the Middle Ages and began to produce art in some sort of self-conscious way. He makes it modern. This is the kind of thing, just as an aside here, I should say, this is the kind of thing that I'm really interested in doing, which is expanding our ideas of how modernity is defined out of the 20th and 21st centuries and looking for much, much earlier example. So this would be an example then from the Italian Renaissance. So then, then modern here, or, or moderno, then, then stands for the, the shift to shift from art of the Middle Ages to art of the Renaissance. Um, so I'm interested in, in the adjective, the, the, the moderno, but I'm also, also really interested here in the verb that Cennini uses, which reduce. Um, the, the, the verb here, I guess the, the transitive would be ridurre, meant to finish, to bring to perfection or to give order. Uh, or in other words, I think it means to give something some style. And in fact, actually, this verb is used a lot in Italian uh, art theory of the time in terms of style. The more common phrase actually is not reduce al moderno, but reduce al maniera, or to reduce to style. So this is frequently, but this frequently is a term that, that's applied to a kind of uh, what uh, bringing, bringing something to perfection. It's, it's really, it's the parallel that I'm interested in here, the parallel uh, between the phrase reduce al moderna and the phrase reduce al maniera, which suggests then that moderna and maniera are more or less the same thing, or that to make something modern and to give it some style are pretty much identical practices. And if you think about that, I suppose it makes a certain amount of sense. I mean, some of this, of course, is just the tremendous egotism of the Italian Renaissance. You know, they believed they were the first people who really cared about art or knew anything about it. Um, but you know, maybe there's something sort of behind this. Uh, the, the present is always conscious of the past. Uh, therefore, I guess it's always going to seem that the present is more conscious than the past because it's conscious of the past. And therefore, it's likely to seem that the present is more self-conscious than the past was and more aware of what it's doing. Um, in other words, then most modern periods uh, would be a little bit like what Giddens says about the, Anthony Giddens says about the 20th century that modernity is this kind of self-reflexivity, kind of self-consciousness. This, I think, is what the, what the uh, uh, Renaissance theorists were also claiming. Um, but I guess it's also the case that you know, the present, if there's any difference between the present and the past at all, that that will make people in the present self-conscious about the possibilities of difference, and particularly about the, the possibilities of, of stylistic difference, and, and will give them a sense of not just, let's say, the arbitrariness of style, but the possi possibility of, of choosing style and also just of the possibility of, of, of manner or of style. So I guess the, the, then the, the conclusion to this much, or to my sort of, uh, what, the little tour through uh, Italian, uh, uh, Renaissance Italian uh, artistic terminology would, would be that, that in a lot of self-conscious notions of what modernity is, modernity and style are, are more or less defined by one another, that they're very closely associated. Uh, and that means, or what that means then is that there's not an association of, of modernity with a particular kind of style or, or a specific style of any kind, but with style as such. So what, what, what Cennino is talking about here when he talks, says, says that something is reduced to the modern, he's not, doesn't mean that Jodo is giving it a particular style. What he's suggesting is, is that Jodo is aware of style and thinks about it uh, in a way that hadn't been the case before. So there's an identity, in other words, between modernity and style as such. The problem with that, I guess, if what we're interested in is trying to understand how modernism works, is that it's very, very difficult to define style as such or to, to define style in general. 
Um, in fact, just about everybody who talks about style in general says they don't know what style in general is. So in my text, and I've got a couple of examples, um, I've, got, uh, the, I've got a 17th century art historian, Agostino Mascardi, who says, uh, of style, if anyone were to ask me what style is, I would have to say, frankly, that I don't know. Um, and then another quotation, I'm not giving you slides for all of these, but another quotation from Wilhelm Boringer, a late 19th century, early 20th century German art historian, uh, who says, everyone means something different by the word style, and a collation of the various definitions and usages of the concept style would illustrate clearly the confusion prevailing in matters of art. So over a 300 year period, I think we've got a, a pretty good uh, agreement here that no one knows what style is. And it's not because it's complicated. And that's not because it's a particularly difficult notion. The problem in defining style is that it's too simple. Uh, it's so simple in a way that we can't really get at it. So style basically, uh, everybody who sort of you know, takes a, a dab at this is something like this. Style is, is a way of doing something. So then all the difficulty, of course, then comes in the ineffable uh, difficulty of trying to distinguish the thing done from the way in which it's done. And that's actually a very difficult distinction to make. Uh, so for example, Monroe Beardsley says, to say something different, in, to say something in a different way is always to say it plus something else. Well, that's great as long as we know what something else means. But you can see that the way he's making this distinction is by giving us two extremely vague terms. Here's it and here's something else. We just don't know what that something else is. Well, the other quotation that I've got in the text is very similar. It's almost exactly the same as the Monroe Beersley. This is from Susan Sontag's essay on style. She says, merely by employing the notion, uh, one is almost bound to invoke, albeit implicitly, an antithesis between style and something else. Well, that, that something else in, in her case is content, I guess. The something else that Beardsley is, is distinguishing, he's trying to distinguish form from content uh, and, and, or style from content. And that's the something else in his quotation. But you can see there's a, there's a kind of a what? Inherent vagueness in, in what people are trying to do here. And the whole problem, of course, is, is and I mean, Sontag is very clear about this in her essay, that we have these, these antitheses, we have these paired terms, like say style and content or manner and matter. They always come together. Uh, we never think of them apart. They're like necessary to one another. But at the same time, everyone agrees that it's impossible to distinguish one from the other. We can't actually draw the line or make the separation between them. So the very fact that we have two words suggests that these are two different things and we should be able to understand style quite separate from, from content, let's say, or we should be able to understand manner as distinct from matter. Uh, but in fact, everyone who thinks seriously about this says that we really can't do this. Now, I think this is one of the reasons why discussions of style in general almost always very quickly transition, uh, sometimes without notice, to discussions of style in particular. Um, and this, this, the ability to do this in English, and I, and I don't know how this works in a lot of other languages, but the ability to do this in English rests on uh, what may be a peculiarity of the word style in English. Um, and that is that in English, style functions as both a count noun and a mass now. Uh, Monroe Beardsley, I think, is almost the only person who's, who's ever actually pointed this out. Um, and uh, just to make that a little bit clearer, um, uh, a count, count nouns would be applied to nouns that were things that we're going to count, and mass nouns would be applied to things that we're going to measure. In relationship to the word style, the way that would work is that uh, as a count noun, you might say, there were five major styles during the Renaissance. But using it as a mass noun, you might say, oh, that dress has a lot of style. So you see in one case, the count noun, you have multiple styles, you can count them. In the other case, you have one style and you measure it out, it has more or less of it. So that's the difference between a count noun and a mass noun. 
Now that corresponds then, the count noun would be style in particular, and the mass noun would be style as such. And that grammatical uh, what quirk in English makes it very easy to actually to transition from talking about style as such or as a mass noun to style in particular um, as a count noun. And the reason that matters is that the discussing style in particular is a great deal easier than discussing style as such. And that's for a very simple reason. Whereas in talking about style as such, we have to deal with the ineffable difference between let's say manner and matter. Uh, but in style in particular, we replace that relationship with the relationship between different manners. So instead of having to figure out what the relationship between, say, style and content is, we talk about what the difference is between different styles. So then when someone like James Elkins, who's a prominent art historian, defines style as a term used for a coherence of qualities in periods or people, um, he, uh, what he's really talking about is a style, not style as such. And when other people do similar things, um, uh, I've got a couple of quotations here from art historians from E.H. Gombrich and J.D. Brown, who talk about, uh, who define style as a distinctive manner or mode. Um, what they're really talking about here is a style and not style as such. Now, I think this has been a great convenience to literary critics and art historians for quite some time, because what that means is that they have been able to talk about styles for a long time without actually knowing what style itself is. So um, how would we go about, is there a way of figuring out what style itself actually is? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but one way to pursue this Make a break, brief pause here for a drink of water. If we look at where st how style comes about, why it should exist at all, um, it's uh, often put down to what you might think of as almost a kind of mistake. So here's a, uh, a very recent quote from Svetlana Alpers and, and Paul Alpers in a very commonly cited uh, essay about style. Uh, since art can never be identical with reality, there is style present in every work. So in other words, uh, it's our, let's assume that it's our aim to, to hold the mirror up to nature and to reproduce it exactly. Since that can't happen, there will always be in, in any body of works or in any individual work, a kind of gap or difference between the attempt to, to mimic nature and nature itself. Um, some of this comes, there's, there's a very interesting uh, quotation here from Diderot that I cited in the original text here, where Diderot asks, if the aim of all artists is to imitate the same nature, then why do their works continue to look so different? But the, the answer to that is, the, is what the Alpers here give us, since art can never be identical with, with reality, there is style in, in every work. What that means then, of course, is that those that difference, that gap, or that that variation uh, between uh, the attempt to render nature and nature itself, will also be more or less distinctive from from person to person. Um, and the, thus, they will they will uh, these various different attempts will differ among themselves. So specific styles will then sort of grow up. Kind of see a number of different references to this effect here on the screen. So going back to Cennini again, the early Italian Renaissance, it's not possible ever to use such diligence um, that one can make the works so similar to nature that they seem to be nature herself. Or I'll hear Francesco Baldinucci, late 17th century says pretty much the same thing. With style, artists establish in their own way an ineffable distance from the agreed upon imitation of the true and natural. Or to, again, to jump all the way into the 20th century and go to Susan Sontag, who says the same thing that these earlier theorists are saying. Whenever speech or movement or behavior or objects exhibit a certain deviation from the most direct, useful, and sensible mode of expression or being in the world, we may look at them as having 
a style. So that's, that's the, you can say across the ages then, a fairly common set of notions about how style arises in the first place. It's, it is a gap uh, in one's attempts to imitate nature, or maybe you almost might wanna say a mistake or an error in one's attempts to imitate nature. One that's a little different for every person and therefore a little different for every place and then for every time. And this is, this is where different styles arise. Now, you can kind of already see, and I don't think all of these people are really speaking in a totally negative way, but you can already kind of see a sort of suspicion growing up here about style as such, which is that actually, you know, if things were working right, we wouldn't have any style, right? That the, the very best situation, of course, we have no style whatsoever, um, and that, that everything would then correspond exactly to, to nature. Um, the uh, another version of this, I guess, would be the historical notion um, that uh, these variations or differences, this gap between style and nature, that this has a tendency to grow over time, um, that the, our attempts to uh, render nature actually accurately don't get closer, but farther away. And also the multiplicity of styles has a tendency to increase over time. So this is where you get, you know, most of your, you know, sort of what historical arcs of change in art history. Uh, common notion about art history is, you know, what art starts off, you know, in a primitive state, it, it gradually improves. It then arrives at some point in the Renaissance at total fidelity to nature. And then it always goes too far. Style proliferates, styles proliferate. Uh, you, get, you get mannerism, you get the Baroque, uh, you get decadence and degeneration. Style in, inevitably goes, you know, it, the, the variety and the multiplicity of it increase and proliferate until soon you get kind of artistic chaos. Um, and, you know, for people who tend to do their world history in terms of art history, this also often leads to, to the decadence and downfall of whole civilizations, right, because style gets farther and farther and farther away from reality. So, as I've said, it, it, in, you know, in some cases, the ideal here would be to have no style, but this is, you know, Diderot says this, the ideal would have no style at all, either in drawing or color, if nature is to be scrupulously imitated. But you can't have no style. I mean, we've already said it's impossible to render nature totally accurately. So we have to have some kind of style. What's the alternative to having no style? Well, the preferable alternative for a lot of people would be to just have one style. If you have absolutely have to have style at all, uh, you should have just one. And my, my example for this is, is Plato, who you know, says a couple of things in a, a dialogue called Laws. Uh, the first one you can see is this, this suspicion of style, the craving for pleasure and the desire to avoid tedium lead us to a constant search for novelty. I can't actually read my own because uh, the, the, the people's faces are across my quotations. I can't read my own quotations off the screen. Cra craving for pleasure, the desire to avoid tedium lead us to a constant search for novelty in music and choral performances that have been thus consecrated may be stigmatized as out of date. So you can see here Plato's fear and hatred of fashion in art here. What's the solution? Well, I mean, in laws, Plato cites the example here, Egypt. Long ago, apparently, they learned the truth of the principle we are putting forward only now that the movements and tunes which the children of the state are to practice in their rehearsals must be good ones. They compiled a list of them according to style and displayed it in their temples. Painters and everyone else who represents movements of the body of any kind were restricted to these forms. Modifications and innovations outside this traditional framework were prohibited and are prohibited even today, both in this field and the arts in general. If you examine their art on the spot, you will find that 10,000 years ago, and I'm not speaking loosely, I mean literally 10,000, paintings and reliefs were produced that are no better and no worse than those of today because the same artistic rules were applied in making them. So 
you see the solution then to, to the chaos of, of artistic styles is to have just one style. I mean, you see that Plato would actually prefer just to have one style, you know, overall. I think he admits you might have to have one style for, say, choral speaking, singing, and maybe one style for sculpture, but you might have to be different styles and different art forms. But basically, the ideal thing would be just to have one style. So this replaces the chaos of, of style with a certainty of a style. And you can kind of see my parallel here. What I'm saying then that what art historians have been doing for a long time silently, which is to replace the vague and loose term style with the more certain and specific notion of a style, is also what Plato wants to do politically here, which is to reduce the multiplicity of styles and to somehow avoid the whole threat of style itself by circumscribing all these various different styles and requiring that, that they only be one. You can see this practice then as you go on through art history. So Hegel, for example, defines style as the concept for the negation of the contingent. <laughs> so in other words, what style is, is consistency, uh, order, uh, uniformity. Uh, and, and you can kind of see too, a, a sort of a, a little bit of a fear here, you know, about the, the threat to the contingent and how, you know, this, uh, a certain kind of st uh, stylistic thinking overcomes that. Or for you know, James Ackerman, this is a very recent, a fairly recent um, quotation along the same lines, for the artist and for his, his audience, style is a protection against chaos. So my point about this is, is that this is not true of style. This is true only of a style. It's only if you take the multiplicity, the contingency, the difference you know, of style as such and reduce it to one specific style that then you can actually see it as a negation of the contingent or a protection against chaos. So what I'm saying then, and if you to think about this in purely logical terms, is that specific style and uh, general style, I'm trying to think about how to, how to put this in, in the most cogent and clear way I possibly can. A style is not a specific instance of style as such. A style is the antithesis of style as such. So the logical relationship between those two things is very different from what you would expect. I mean, it seems to make sense that a style would be a specific instance of style as such. And obviously in practice, that's usually the case. But in purely, in purely if you think about the way this has worked out and the way people use, use the concept of style, it actually turns out that a style is the antithesis of style as such. And there are a number of, let me make that specific in a number of ways that I think are really relevant to the way this works in any kind of modern situation. Of course, I'm using modern again in a very trans-historical and, and quite, quite wide way. So for example, style as such, um, since it is a departure from the natural, right? So style has already been defined here as, as it, what's a failure to imitate nature or a neglect, to imitate, an inability to imitate nature. Since style as such is, is always to some extent unnatural, it will always seem a little foreign. So um, I've got a quote in the original text here from uh, Sforza Pallavicino, late 17th century art, uh, art critic, who says that style always has much of the foreign in it. Now, of course, a style is always appropriate. Right? A style is always proper. It's always specific to a particular person or a particular city or, or country uh, or a particular period of time. So one of the then basic differences between style as such and a style is that style as such is foreign, but a style is always appropriate. Um, the other thing you can see that's sort of uh, suspicious and a little bit scary about style as such, and you can see this in, in uh, the, the Plato uh, quotations I've already uh, delivered, well, and that is that there's always a suspicion that style as such has something to do with fashion. 
that it's not just that it departs from nature, but that it continues to depart from nature, that there's going to be change over time, that it will never settle down, that it will always be different, um, that there's going to be something, what, ornamental, artificial, uh, additional about style. Uh, I think when you dig into this at all, it uh, certainly turns out that the ornamental, the artificial, the additional usually gets gendered in discussions of this kind. So that style as such um, usually is or often is thought to be sexually indeterminate uh, or maybe maybe feminine, but it's certainly sexually indeterminate. So I've got then um, uh, the, uh, actually uh, quote from Sontag that I thought I had put into my slide, but I guess I hadn't. So Sontag you know, says in, in her notes on camp that all style that is artifice is ultimately epicene. Now she means this in a very defiant way. And she means to make, make the epicene into um, something that's, that's positive. But what she's uh, confronting here is the common notion that style as such is, is since it's additional and ornamental is, is maybe feminine, but certainly sexually indeterminate. One of the first moves of a style then is always to uh, divide things up in terms of gender. So quoting again from the same Plato dialogue, uh, the muses would never make the ghastly mistake of composing the speech of men to a musical idiom suitable for women or fitting rhythms appropriate to the portrayal of slaves and slave-like people to the tune and bodily movements used to represent free men. So you know, uh, uh, when a style is appropriate, the first thing that it's appropriate to, I think, is gender. Uh, the other thing, and this, I guess, is, is really the most relevant to a discussion of style and, and modernity, is that that style is, is usually associated with novelty. It's usually associated with, with change. Um, and you know, therefore, with, uh, I guess, a certain kind of, of modernity as such. But style, a style, and I hope I'm keeping these grammatical distinctions clear as I'm going through these, but if style as such is always associated with novelty and with change, a style is always associated with consistency. So uh, I got a quotation here then from, from Meyer Shapiro, uh, who's written some very influential things about style, where Shapiro defines style as, by style I usually, is usually meant the constant form and sometimes the constant elements, qualities, and expressions in the art of an individual or group. So in other words, where style as such is all about change and novelty, a style is constant and consistent. And again, you can see, I mean, you can see Shapiro is claiming to be defining style as such. And what I'm saying is that he's actually defining a style and it's only by, by trans, fix, trans, uh, what, change, trans, translating the discussion from style as such to a style that he's able to make style mean something constant and consistent as opposed to something changeable and uh, what, intractable. So I guess my last quotation on, uh, along these lines um, actually is uh, from elsewhere in the Shapiro essay, and for some reason I didn't put it up on this slide. But elsewhere in the same essay, uh, Shapiro talks about style as a common ground against which innovations may be measured. So style then, in other words, which originally was all about change and novelty is all now about constancy and consistency. And actually, you see, if you add up all of the various different attributes and associations with style that I've just been talking about, in other words, it's about novelty, it's about change, it's about variety, it's about sexual indeterminacy, it's about you know, sort of political threat in various different ways. What you can see is that all of these qualities are qualities that are usually associated with modernism or with modernity. This is, this is what modernism is. Uh, when, when you do the shift from style as such to a style, then all of a sudden you get the opposite of all of those qualities. So now all of a sudden style is a common ground against which innovations may be measured. Or in other words, it's the very opposite of modernism or the very opposite of modernity. So this is basically um, 
you know, it I, is more or less the conclusion, I guess, of, 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 of this part of the chapter and the conclusion of, of, of this talk, which, which I might sum up, I guess, um, by saying that what the history of the term style seems to show is that there is in fact a very, very close relationship between modernism and style as such, or style in general, but not a strong relationship between modernism and a style. In fact, if, if all this, what I've just been summing up is, is, is at all convincing, then it would mean that, that modernism is kind of biased or opposed to or antithetical to everything that people say about a style. The conclusion from that, and I don't want to get too practical here because I'm very general abstract all the way through, but if you want to just start drawing some sort of semi-practical conclusions from that, the conclusion would be that it's not really a kind of intellectual failure when Jameson can't come up with a single, you know, coherent stylistic definition for modernism. Uh, the whole effort uh, of actually trying to come up with a modernist style then would be actually completely wrongheaded and totally pointless. That modernism should be concerned with style as such and not style in particular. And maybe again, to just, just to be semi-practical about this, um, what, certainly one of the reasons why most of the major modernist figures never did have a style, which is to say they had many styles, right? So Joyce doesn't have a style. And Gertrude Stein doesn't have a style, and Virginia Woolf doesn't have a style, and Eliot doesn't have a style. They, they never basically wrote the same work twice. They always moved on to different, and in, in, in many ways, very, very different stylistic habits. One of the reasons for this is that they aren't actually trying to define or to promote or to create a period style at all but actually trying to explore all the possibilities of, of style as such. Um, and so if we follow that out, then we would say that we could actually give up on the notion of kind of what anatomizing the style of modernism, but still talk about this as a term um, if we happen to want to. So that's as much as I have for that. That brings me to my conclusion. And I've also noticed, you know, I'm doing this from home and uh, there's really noisy construction going on right next door to me. And I've just noticed that this big truck completely full of dirt has just pulled up in front of my house. So it looks like a good time, a good time for me to stop. Wow. Um, thank you so very much for this brilliant talk. And that you mentioned Gumbrecht, Professor Gumbrecht. I remember how once he said that, you know, what scholars in literary studies are doing humanities, this is meditation. You know, this is, <laughs> that's, that's how I'm thinking about your, your talk, uh, which was transhistorical and historical at the same time. Um, um, wow, you know, uh, for me, very, very interesting. So definitely I, I'm looking forward to reading your book. Uh, is it ready? No, no. In fact, I have to admit that I was working on this um, when COVID hit and the libraries all closed and I didn't have an office. Um, actually, um, it was worse than just COVID because in February of 2020, uh, a pipe broke in the top floor of our building and flooded a lot of the rooms below. And so just before COVID, everything was removed from my office uh, so that they could fix the water damage. And uh, it wasn't moved back in until the summer of 2020, at which time I wasn't going back to campus anymore. So no library, no office. And this project stalled out to such an extent that I really have almost started something else, to be perfectly frank. I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. Uh -huh. It does uh, sound like a chapter of a very interesting book because then I was thinking about really more, uh, you know, if you follow up that theme about, you know, responding to what actually seems to have entered the literary language, you know, we're talking about Hemingwayan style, for example, and then when I was reading Hemingway, I decided that there is nothing like Hemingway's style because he, even Hemingway actually was changing 
um, the way he, he was writing, yes. And so uh, so this is what I felt like, you know, experientially. And you are you seem to to um, confirm this that there is so, so much more happening um, with this term. Any questions? You know, I'm I would like to open the floor if you're ready to take questions, please. Sure. Sure. Right, so we have a question from uh, Katarzyna Kociołek, our faculty member. Katia. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Professor. This was a really, and I, for me, it was an, uh, an eye-opening eye uh, lecture, so thanks a lot. Uh, I've got a question um, to this category of style, if, it, if you treat it as a category that is within or intrinsic to the work of art, or is it something that is imposed from the outside on the work of art? Um, I, you might have to illuminate a little bit what you actually mean by that question. Um, are you talking about the work of art as if it were self-generated? Um, mm, I'm thinking about um, the quote that you uh, mentioned, that style is a protection against chaos. And I'm thinking about all the debates in the visual arts when the artists would reject being classified or being um, sort of associated with a specific style. And these were the moments when I thought that uh, while listening to your, uh, to your lecture, that uh, the style is, um, or style or a style uh, is a category that is always outside and as if um, in the making, that it's discursively produced. So, um, yeah, a, a cruder way of a cruder way, perhaps, of paraphrasing your question we, would be to say that style is something that critics care about and scholars, and that artists don't much. Yes, I mean artists will always say, "Oh no, I'm not doing that." The same Bob Dylan would always say, "I'm not a protest singer," and you then would say, "Well, what were all those protest songs about that you were doing?" Uh, but but artists would always tend to disclaim they don't want to look like they're working from a formula. Um, and they don't want to um, look like they're producing the same thing every time. So they would always disclaim a, a kind of style. And I would say, you know, that you might even, you know, sort of divvy that up a little bit if you wanted to take my term style as such and, and style in particular and say that style in particular really is uh, a kind of scholarly convenience and a convenience for critics. Uh, where, but where, where artists and writers will often care about style as such. I mean, they will care very much about the way in which they're doing things, but they wouldn't want it ever to become a style in, in, in the terms that I was defining in the paper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, if you do not want to ask a question using um, your webcam and uh, your uh, mic, you can also write your questions into the chat and we will read them out to Professor Mo. I, I have a question, if I can ask you a question. Um, uh, actually, two questions. One, a very simple one. Uh, would your line of thinking, probably yes, that would make even more sense when I'm thinking about the notion of a style of thought. Um, because you've been talking about art and giving also quoting um, those in, uh, you know, in visual art. I'm thinking, you know, and we are talking about, you know, reality representation and that distance and, you know, um, the manner, yes, of uh, bridging the gap. Mm -hmm. Now, um, with that notion of style of thought also um, work within the same framework. And then another question would be about uh, the, the term of a technique used by, uh, you know, uh, new criticism. You know, I had, I had a sense that they were replacing the notion of style with that of technique um, in the, in the, in the, that was around what, 1940s. And um, and is it would that shift be related not only to the fascination with science, yes, but would that shift also be related to something that you were talking about that this is the point at which 
modernism and with its proliferation of voices uh, standing for liberation and that it, it becomes canon, canonical, yes? And so that's maybe there is something going on here. So those two questions. Yeah, I guess to, to uh, attack the first one first, uh, obviously there's gotta be, I mean, if, st if style is just a way of doing something, everything will have style, but right? you can't do something without doing something in a particular way. So there, I think, and there will, any time that there's any possibility for any sort of variation at all, then, then clearly there would have to be style. So there's, I, there's no reason why a thought couldn't be, uh, couldn't be produced in a particular way. And, and that, that would be somehow ineffably, undefinably distinct from the content of, of the thought. I think you could say, you know, apply the same terms that you would to a work of art. Uh, as far as style and technique, of course, yeah, a lot of times people would, would talk about those two things as, as if they were synonymous. Um, but as you say, I think that the second seems to be a little science, scientistic, right? It has a kind of spurious scientific feel to it. And that's um, almost certainly one of the reasons why it appealed to the new critics, who, as you say, you know, were trying to seem sort of hard nosed and practical and useful and you know, in their own weird way, kind of politically engaged. So yeah, I'd say the shift, the shift from style to technique. Um, it, and it's also a, maybe just another attempt to get around uh, the uh, amorphousness and vagueness of the concept style. I mean, that's one of the major reasons why people would generally try, try to avoid it, right? Because you know, we don't actually know what it is. We don't know how to deploy it. And so it's much easier, you know, when you teach, you know, you, you don't necessarily always want to say, this is the style of this work. You would say, look, this is what this, this is what they're doing. This is what they do here. And this is what they do there. You focus on, on the specifics of technique. And certainly as you go through in a class, what you might frequently do is say, okay, well, here's the, the here's the way this person did this. And this is the difference between, I'll um, make this comparison between these two writers. And that's easier to do, obviously, than to come up with some kind of overarching notion of, of, of you know, sort of style that you could apply to everything. I mean, the other thing that, that might be said, uh, just an extension of some of this, um, about um, the, the way some of this works. And I was talking about, about the appropriateness of a style and how style in particular is always proper or appropriate. Uh, or you know, what specific is tied to a particular person or place or time. Uh, one of the things that means then is that in, in that case, a style is usually mimetic. So if you think about the way we talk about particular styles, we all, I mean, the, the, way they, the way they put this in the Renaissance was style reflects the man. And so that's the Renaissance motto. Uh, a, a style always was mimetic of the person who produced that style. And then later on, you know, then you add those up and you say, okay, well then all the Venetian painters all work in a Venetian style. And so, so then this style then is mimetic of the situation in Venice or this style then, is then we would do it in temporal terms. This style then is mimetic of the Renaissance. This is how style becomes a really very fundamental term you know, in art and literary history is by making it mimetic of something, which of course is to make it not style anymore. <laughs> Once it's mimetic, then you've, you've done away with all the difficult problems that are created by the fact that style as such is a departure from the mimetic. You, you make it mimetic and meaningful um, and then, right, all the, all the threat of it and the difficulty of the craziness of it has gone away. Um, while we are uh, waiting for other questions, um, I have a question. I don't know if I, right, uh, if, I, uh, if I'm correct, but um, the way that you talked about the connection between uh, style as such and modernity and the fact that the ideas that are associated in critical discourse with style as such are also central for uh, modernity, the way that we uh, the way that um, we typically see it. 
Um, uh, so my question would be, what about postmodernity and postmodernism? Because some of the ideas that you mentioned, like this sexual indeterminacy or uh, the artifice, this anti-mimetic quality would be even stronger in postmodernity, the way that it is typically perceived. So would you like to comment on, on that? Well, yeah, the first thing I want to say is that I'm a pretty strict atheist when it comes to postmodernism. <laughs> I think the reason that uh, many of the things that one might say about modernism might also be applied to postmodernism is that perhaps there's no actual difference there at all and that the second thing didn't in fact exist. Um, I don't, I shouldn't maybe put it quite as crudely <laughs> as confrontationally as that. It's beautiful, the 80s there, right? Yes, wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, if you think about that in terms of, you know, the distinction between the periods, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I think the distinction, the stylistic distinctions, or let's say the kinds of stylistic terms that were used to distinguish those two movements were, were a little bit hard to, to um, uh, distinguish from one another. So in other words, people would say that say modernism did parody, but postmodernism did pastiche. Right? Well, that's all well and good if you're really pretty certain about what the difference between parody and pastiche is. But that's a fine enough distinction that I don't think it can actually um, support the notion that these are different eras. So, I mean, if I go back to my original, you know, sort of atheistical skepticism about that distinction, um, I mean, it's obvious that there are, are um, both what uh, ideological and, in fact, stylistic distinctions between works that got done during the postmodern period and works that got done earlier. Um, but it's not a, a dichotomy. I mean, it's not an earth shaking, you know, total transformation or difference between eras which is the way it was presented you know, at a certain point in the 70s and, and, and the 80s. So if there is in fact a kind of consistency in effort here, I think it's because I think there's more of a continuum. Um, and in fact, I mean, if you look at, um, I mean, not to just go on and on about this topic, but um, you look at, at the way Jameson's work has developed, I mean, he's sort of the person you know, who gave us you know, the roadmap for postmodernism. But lately, you can see that mostly he's really more interested in talking about either modernity or much or earlier periods, going back to like the 18th and the 19th centuries. Uh, he hasn't had an awful lot to say about you know, his sort of um, what a branded period recently. And I think that's, that's a, a kind of instance of a general return to modernism as a, a much, much larger, uh, longer category than, than you know, people would, would, would talk about late modernism of the 1940s or the 1950s, and um, that seems to me to be a little bit premature, actually, to talk about late modernism of that, that particular era. So I'm sorry, some of that's a little bit irrelevant to your question, but, but uh, perhaps. No, but thank you. Thank you. That, that answers it. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> All right. Do we have any other questions? Oh, you still yeah, I, I, I think I have one, and, and this is... Um... This is something that I've been thinking about for the last 10 minutes, and um, I don't know if I can phrase it um, very well, but I was thinking about the difference between style and convention. Um, you know, and the fact that when we talk about style, there is some, some excitement in it, that style is, con you know, kind of, like in my head at least, is connected with experimentation, seeking new ways of doing something or writing something or painting something. And then convention is something which is sedimented and boring and everything knows about it and, you know, there is nothing interesting in it. But somehow these two, they are similar because both of them are about a way of doing or presenting something. So would you have a comment on it? Yeah, that's an interesting, that's a really interesting question. It goes back to, you know, my, my Renaissance art theorists. Uh, who thought of the period before them as a time of convention and of tradition. I mean, if you wanted to map, map style and convention onto to the period terms we've been using, you'd map them onto to, to modern and traditional, right? So a, a traditional society has conventions uh, and a modern society has style, 
Uh, what the what the the Renaissance art theorist wanted to say was that in the Middle Ages everything was done by habit, uh, and everything was automatic. People weren't really thinking about it much. And then once we got to the Renaissance, then we actually started doing things on purpose, and that's where style came in. Well, I've been very conscious lately, you know, particularly uh, drawing all this from the Renaissance of the intense hostility from medieval scholars <laughs> to this division. <laughs> and, you know, and, and actually, you know, if you read around a little bit, um, medieval scholars are very, very hostile to the term modern and to the whole notion of modernity. Because for them, it's part of a, it's part of a dyad, right? modernity and tradition. And it's part of a dyad that they want to get rid of. In other words, they, they, don't, they don't want there to be that distinction because it's always been an invidious one, right? Between the modern periods and the traditional periods. And they point out, I think quite rightly, that that, that uh, temporal division is often mapped off onto geography in contemporary times. So then you get countries that are traditional even now and that have to get modernized so that they can catch up with countries that are already modernized. There's a whole lot of invidious distinctions that are wrapped up in that. Uh, what those medieval scholars would say is, I guess sort of what you were saying in part of your question, which is that there's not really any difference between tradition and style. <laughs> um, they're, they're really the same thing. And, and to try to say that one is self-conscious and intelligent and up-to-date and one is kind of retrograde and backwards and automatic um, is, is really to uh, impose a set of distinctions that at least in practical real terms, you know, just doesn't exactly exist. So convention then, as you suggest, is, is really just, it's in an invidious term. And it's one that you want to use for styles that have ossified and gotten old and that we'd like to get rid of. But everything, you know, I mean, I think you could say pretty easily, it's tradition here, it's style here. Uh, the only difference is, right, a little bit of difference maybe in, in uh, temporal relations. And I have, you know, uh, kind of a comment. Would that distinction that you're making between style and a style would be still the, the, the distinction between the convention and style, but one pretending that it's not a convention, but still it becomes a convention. So it, actually, this is that moment of transition when that <laughs> ossified, you know, uh, unified uh, style, yes, um, becomes a convention, but it pretends that it's not a convention. And uh, so there is another element, I think, of, of a difference here is the illusion, yes, that it's, that it's um, receptive to newness and uh, openness and, and that it's modern. In, uh, if, we, uh, if we identify being modern with uh, um, forward-looking, open, yes, and receptive to novelty. What yeah, do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, see, one of the things that I'm, I'm kind of doing, you know, is trying to point out and maybe a little bit to oppose the way in which people talk about style now, because they'll use the term style um, as, as if it were style as such. But I think all the instances, and I think this is just endemic to, to the way people use the term, what they're really talking about is a style and not style as such. What that means then is that they're talking about something that's not contingent, that's fixed, that's, that is in fact conventional. Uh, it's much easier to talk about and much easier to deal with, but they're talking about it as if it were this other thing, which is very ineffable and hard to get a handle on and, and, very, and various and kind of full of change and interest. And, and it's, it's a bit of a shell game. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of, yeah, saying that you're talking about one thing and actually talking about something quite different. And I would like to thank you so very much for saving a style style for me because I was so troubled by this notion because it, it did sound pretty elitist, you know, uh, capturing it when I was thinking, you know, uh, for example, you know, with references to those styles of various authors, writers, 
which I thought it's a, in an easy way out, for example, of, mm. of um, paying a lot of attention to those authors and, you know, um, uh, and meeting them, yes. So mm. I, to me, it was a shorthand hand for intellectual laziness or sloppy way of reading. Um, and I think that, you know, through this lecture, you really <laughs> saved this, this um, somehow concept to me. So I don't know if I should be thankful or not, but <laughs> definitely that was interesting. Good, thank you. Are there any other questions? A long thing. Uh, that, in, that, yeah. There is something in the chat box. Oh, a comment. Comment. Uh, okay. So Piotr Wismek uh, has written, I have to admit that I have always been interested in the phenomenon of inspiration in literature. The more I study literature, the more connections between works I can see. For example, I recall James Joyce admitting that he read Lawrence Stern and was inspired by him. Can we argue that modernism was not exactly something new? Is literature in general about finding new ways to express old forms and themes? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, one of the things that I've been doing, you can kind of tell, um, by the the concentration on on Renaissance art theory in this 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 talk, um, is I've been thinking about um, modernism as a recurrent um, phenomenon. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of different ways, a lot of different sort of temporal um, templates you could use for modernism. One would be that modernism just happens once. Uh, there's this huge sort of break in the middle of history. Um, another would be that modernism actually happens in recurrent ways. And so I found it really actually pretty useful in, in thinking about these very, very general concepts of modernism to go back in time, you know, to look at, look at the Renaissance, where as you can see from, from the terminology from Cennini, they thought of themselves as modern. Um, it's actually the case that, that say in Rome, in, you know, Hellenistic Greece and Rome, there was a, a, a lot of the social and political qualities that we think of as a part of modernity, and uh, certainly some of the same attitudes towards art that we think of as having to do with modernism. Uh, maybe in the Enlightenment, even you know, if we want to hang on to that term for a while, you know, there was something similar going on. And, and once you start multiplying things that way, you say, oh, okay, so it happened, you know, back here, you know, in Hellenistic times, and then it happened again in the Renaissance, and then it happened again in Latin. You can say, well, it actually probably happened in between a lot of times, too. So you begin to get a sense here of modernism and modernity as more or less kind of constants uh, through history. There's certainly maybe some times when they're not very strong. Um, but uh, you, you could go even beyond the sort of what periodic or recurrent sense of modernism that I was just laying out and, and think of it as a kind of constant impulse in literature of most times. So certainly there are some times when people don't want to be up to date. There are some times when they do. And, you know, it would not be odd then for there to be, you know, a kind of, of transhistorical sympathy between someone like Joyce and someone like Stern, there, there are in fact a lot of similarities you know, between those works. And, um, you know, I mean, you know, Joyce was interested in Vico, you know, he was interested in, in Bruno, he was interested in, in, in lots of um, uh, philosophers and, and literature of the past. I mean, he's doing, he's doing the Odyssey after all. So, um, you know, once, once you start, you know, thinking of, of modernism, not as something that we have to say did it happen in 1890 or 1895 or 1922, I mean, not to diss my own book, but it doesn't actually say that modernism happened in 1922. Um, if you stop thinking of it in terms of singular revolutions and start thinking of it in terms of sort of general attitudes, about ideology or politics or literature, you know, then it becomes much easier to find it in all sorts of different places and, and all sorts of different times. Um, and it becomes easier to see why all the authors, you know, that, that you know, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, ran off a little sort of list of modernist authors, you know, at the start of this, most of those uh, 
had habits that are very similar to the habits that you see in Ulysses. So there's a very, very strong tendency amongst, let's say, you know, you can see it in Joyce, you can see it in Eliot, just for a couple, to, to go forward by going back, or to go back as a way of going forward. And I think it's easy to see that pattern, right? Going back so as to go forward. You can see that way far back in history. It's not, it's not something that really just happened in the 20th century. So, so, so this sort of relying on the past as a kind of jumping off point to move into some sort of future, if that's what Joyce is doing in your example with Lawrence Stern, um, that, that I think is, that's a pretty consistent and trans-historical feature of a lot of literature and art. Um, so is there uh, then uh, something that differentiates this moment in history, a long moment uh, that we refer to as modernism, that we think about as modernism? Well, right, yeah, you've identified the, the, the sort of the danger of the, the, what, the, what I was just saying, that we end up with, with nothing. Maybe I'm saying the same thing as, as Sean Latham and Gail Rogers, there is no such thing. <laughs> Um, but <clears throat> I don't know, I mean, here's, here's the thing. Um, we've been very, very concerned for a long time now to do something about what I think has been perceived for a long time as the exclusivity of modernism. Mm -hmm. um, we see that this desire to overcome that primarily in geographical terms right now so that we don't any longer want to see modernism in terms of something that happened in Paris or New York or London. We want to see it in Warsaw. We want to see it in Benares, you know, in Tokyo. You know, there's, there's, there's a very strong move here to, to geographically generalize and to, to get over the, the, say, the geographical exclusivity of, of the modern. Um, be that as it may, and setting all that to one side for a second, I'm not sure why we don't also do that in historical terms, because after all, the source of the original source of that geographical exclusivity was temporal. Right? It was the temporal exclusivity in the first place. It was the notion that modernism only happened once. Right? That was you know, the, the basis of the notion that it only happened these places. And so I think that it should be part and parcel of our attempt to, to generalize modernism and to get it out of its exclusive bailiwick in the great capitals of Europe and the United States, uh, would be also to generalize it temporally and historically, right? And to say that it didn't necessarily happen just once. Um, one way in which that might be done, and maybe this is not a, not a great idea, but you could see it a little bit when I was quoting from Anthony Giddens you know, earlier in, in the talk. Uh, you know, Giddens defines a modern society in terms of self-reflexiveness. Well, it's pretty obvious that a lot of societies in earlier periods of time have been self-reflexive. You know, they've reflected on, on themselves. Um, and, and, and actually, you will see a fair amount. I mean, it's a very interesting trend, for example, in, in art, history, art history of the ancient, of ancient, the ancient world, uh, for them to really be talking about, like, say, for example, the art market in the ancient world, um, uh, art collecting in the ancient world, self-conscious um, connoisseurship in the ancient world. So in other words, you know, what, a, what certain art scholars of the ancient world have been saying is that, well, actually, no, all art objects weren't just ritual objects, and they weren't just political objects, you know, even, say, in, you know, in Hellenistic times. There was an art market, there were art collectors, there were art connoisseurs, there was, you know, everything we think of as modernity, you know, going on then. Um, so to some extent, you might say, well, that is sort of intellectually imperialistic, because we're, like, importing our terms back. But maybe that's just a first step in trying to do something about the historical exclusiveness of the modern, which to me is actually in some ways more fundamental than the geographical exclusiveness of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think this is the point to really let you uh, start your day. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I uh, thank you so very much again. I hope 
will have an opportunity to host you here in person um, in the not so remote future. Who knows? Let's uh, let's keep trying. Thank you so very much. A big, big applause. Um, have a very good rest of the day. And, uh, and I would like to thank everybody who is here with us still and, uh, and all my students in modernism. I love you. If you don't know that I love you, now you know. Thank you so very much for really coming. Um, Okay. Very, very thanks, thanks, thanks very much for inviting me uh, and for, for listening and, and bearing with me. So. Thank you. Thank you uh, for getting up so early and talking to us. And I have to admit, because I organized these lectures, that it has been one of the most popular lectures ever. So uh, at 4 p.m. in Poland, people are you know, it's their free time and they are not too much into those non-obligatory classes and lectures and so many people came. Uh, so um, the expectations that we had were high, but I think that everyone uh, will leave happy. And uh, so thank you. Thank you so much. for. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Speaking. Yes, I think I may actually go and take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye. 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 Bye.